This episode of Hack 5 is brought to you by Domain.com. Hello and welcome to Hack 5. My name is Darren Kitchen. My name is Shannon Morse. It's your weekly dose of Technolust. Welcome to the show. Very excited. Yeah. Because you're about to disappear and Mike Osmond's going to take your place. <laughs> well, I guess that's oh. all we need. It's not, not, that'll, that, work. that'll work. We'll go with that. <laughs> Actually, my elbow just switched the camera. Cue <laughs> <laughs> <Q> Mike! <laughs> <laughs> All right, so I'm going to fire up RF Cat and use my yardstick one. Now, one of the things I like to do, I could have done this in the first place, is use the spectrum analyzer that's built into RF Cat. Ooh, you know what? I don't think we've demoed the spectrum analyzer that's built into RF Cat. See, this is a great time for this. All you do is type d.specan in the interactive Python shell, and ta da! Spectrum analyzer. Wait a second. But <laughs> what frequency are we looking at? Oh, we're looking at 900 megahertz. Oh, okay, so it defaults to 900. It defaults to uh, going from 902 to 928, which is. There's the 900 megahertz ISM band in the US. Lots of fun stuff so there. So if I close the window and then I just say d.specan 300 million or 300 e6, sure. then I get something that goes from 300 to 320 oh, something hey. megahertz. Oh, so, hey. So just like before, we, would, so we wouldn't even need a software defined radio technically Except. if we just wanted to see what was there. Right. It, it doesn't seem as good looking as the FFT that we were, that the Osmocom FFT. No, because it's, it's a cruder implementation. Mm -hmm. But it's super useful, especially if you don't have SDR at your, at your fingertips. Mm -hmm. uh, this is one way I should be able to pick up a signal. Uh, like there, the oh, again. look at that. Whoa, oh. big huge spike around oh, 315 wow. megahertz. But notice this looks like it's just above 315 megahertz. The HackRF told us it was just below 315 megahertz. Well, you it's know, not quite what's as a few precise. megahertz between friends? <laughs> right. <laughs> Right. Uh, there are there's a distinct step size. Okay. That it, it's it's tuning the radio to one frequency, measuring the power, then tuning the radio to the next frequency, and oh, going I through see that loop saying. very that's rapidly. That's why the uh, that's why it doesn't seem as fast. Exactly. It's yeah. not as fast. It's not as precise, but it's still useful. That is. And actually, I'm going to increase the length of my telescopic antenna here uh, to be closer to 315 megahertz. Uh, but uh, yeah, if I Punch in numbers and then hit my thing. Oops, it it again. goes. There it is. I probably didn't even need my antenna tuned very precisely since I'm at close range. But it's a quick and easy way to just sort of verify mm -hmm. that the the yardstick one is receiving the same signal nice. that I was getting on my HackRF one. So let's take a look at what we can do. And one of the things I love about RF Cat is that it gives you this interactive Python shell. Yes, and lots of fun. If people aren't familiar with IPython, mm -hmm. that's what this is based on, IPython. And it gives you things like help. You can do help on this object D and say like, oh, these are all the different things I can do with oh, that D. It's man. amazing. I mean, you can, it, it's cool. Explore the help system. And you can also uh, import Files. So I have a little text file. Oh, so if you've already written like a, mm -hmm. a function or something, you can just pull it right in. And that's exactly what I'm going to do. If I, uh, where is it? It's somewhere around here. I start. I have this little program called sl.py, and here it is. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I like to do is flip back and forth between a text editor and an interactive Python shell. So if I have something like this interactive Python shell, I can just load it into Python. Mm. But let's do something just a little, but since it's a little interactive. bit interactive at yeah, first. Yeah, well, okay, well, so before I get to that, let me okay. just do a couple things. I see like, where this is going. <laughs> let me just set the frequency. Uh, what is it? Set freak. Uh, Tab completion is awesome. Three fourteen nine eighty. I'll do, which is the precise frequency that I got out of Inspectrum, and then I'll set the modulation. Uh, what is it? Modu. I'm, I think I, it's MDM. Oh, right, right. Modem modulation. Remember, this is a digital modem mm. on a chip. And I'll set it to the, what is it? it mod ASK. ASK. Ook. Ook. There we go. Love the tab completion. And uh, then I need to set the data rate, which is set modem data, D rate, right? Yep. D rate. Oops. There, I can't type. But here we go. 2450. That's what I got. So was you're doing 2450. We've been mm -hmm. doing it as a fraction of a second. Okay. Well, I guess there's two, this is this is two this is two thousand four hundred and fifty time units per, per second. second. Right. Okay, that makes sense. Right. So it's the it's the rate in 
symbols per second. In baud, essentially. Exactly. It's a, it's baud, a baud rate. rate. That's okay. exactly what and it is. And since it's a modem, it um, that makes more sense now. Yeah. So uh, now this is where we could just start doing like d dot uh, r f listen. Okay. And start capturing. And, and if we start do capturing that, stuff, and we start getting garbage. And if I type in a code and try to transmit something, look at this. Nothing seems to be happening. The little LED on this goes on like it's transmitting, but I don't get anything. Why now, is that? Why do you think this might be? <laughs> the, the, and the reason But we're is, listening on the frequency in yep. the modulation and uh, at the right data rate. So if it sent something, it should receive it. You would think so. But this modem has a couple of features that need to be set up in ah. order for it to correctly identify that a packet has happened. One of the things that it oh, looks for. Do we have to tell it the preamble or something? We have to tell it about the preamble, mm. and we have to tell it about a sync word or a synchronization word, or sometimes that's called an access code, some kind of a, a, a predictable sequence of bits that it should look for at the beginning of a packet. Oh, because otherwise we might just get a bunch of garbage because of ionosphere or something. Right. Mm. So here's what I like to do I like to say, uh, now it. it the type of preamble that it looks for mm -hmm. is 10101010. Which is what we've been finding a lot of in most of these consumer devices. But remember on this device, it yeah, started out not. with something that looks like 110, was 110, like 110, 110, right. right? This thing is waltzing, not two stepping. So mm. we need to uh, actually turn off the preamble detection function. And the way we do that. Oh, well, yeah, I was about to say, can't we just go into raw mode or something? Yeah, uh, mm -hmm. something like that. Yeah. Uh, we could just have it like continuously demodulate for us, but we do want it to actually like give us chunks of yeah, data. Yeah, yeah. It would be nice to kind of use the features in the modem the best we can. Uh, I'm going to refer to my my uh, little cheat sheet here. Set packet PQT, which is d dot set packet. PQT, that is preamble quality threshold, and I'm going to tell it to use a preamble quality <laughs> threshold of zero. Nice. <laughs> so now when you rerun that. Well, I have one more thing to do, and that is I need to give it a sync word. I need to tell it what pattern of bits to look for. And what I want to give it is something that's like 1101010110. Now, if you look at. Are uh, we just going to guess? Gonna, or? I'm going to use like a, um, I'm going to use a hex value or. Here's what I here's what I did in my little script. I used this this value 06 dB. But if you look at 06 dB, if you do a bin of 06 dB, oop, I don't know how to type there. You can see that this is the pattern 11011011111. Yeah. Uh -huh. So if I want if I wanted to take like a 16 bit right. pattern that's that's what I'm looking for. That would be it. In fact, you could go d dot set modem sync word, and just type it in binary if you want, like one one zero one one zero one one zero one one. So you have to make sure that you give it sixteen bits. Did I do that right? Looks like one two three four five six seven eight. That's totally ten. wrong. Uh, oh, we, uh, oh, you know what? Because I had some uh, zeros at the beginning, ah. but that's okay. Uh, anyway, that's one way you could do it is just by binary, uh, or you can give it a hex number. But either way, it's looking for 16 bits. It wants to try to do a pattern match and find 16 bits at the beginning of the packet. Mm. So now it's set with the right frequency and the right modulation and the right data rate, and it's set with the right sync word. So hopefully <laughs> this time. And it's ignoring the preamble. OK. So if we do an RF listen again, now let's try transmitting a packet. And we also didn't get a bunch of oh, garbage. Look oh, look at that. Hey. Now, do you see how there's a bunch of stuff here where you see like 6 dB, 6, 6 dB, 6 dB, 6 dB. Yeah, and in this next chunk, 6 dB. Well, yeah, there we are 6 see DBA, like a preamble. We're seeing a lot of repetition. Yes. Right? That's good. And that is a very good indication that during those periods of time, we're seeing things, that we're seeing actual information. Let's try this again. Okay. If I enter in a different code and hit the lock button, there we go. We get some more. Junk on the screen. Now, what are we going to do with this junk? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> okay, we're going to process it somehow. We there need to turn it into. I mean, it, is there a way to systematically just pipe that into the? I mean, you've written a function, obviously. I have. I have. Okay, but well, here's here's what we're going to do. Uh, I'm going to go take. I'm going to go look at this text file that I started, which gives me this RxSL uh, uh, function, 
which sets up my radio in the same way that I just did. Mm -hmm. And it also gives me the uh, a, a, a little routine that's similar to that RF listen mm -hmm. and allows me to do it like this. So here's here's what I do. Here's the cool thing is in since oh, it's, just since it's another, IPython, yeah. you just go percent run sl.py, boom, and it just imported that. Nice. And so now, now you can I actually have, start using that I have that RxSL function. And uh, oops, wait. I have, you have to, to give it a parameter? D. <laughs> and <laughs> uh, <laughs> then oh, he's gotta now, <laughs> now here's what happens. You see how it looks very similar, except I've trimmed it down. Oh, because so I've, we get a much I've given it a packet length. Right, I saw that right. in the, the Python let's, file. Let's take a you look switch at back the, over to yeah, that yeah, yeah, yeah. Vi. That was the the that last thing. Thirty f len. So I'm only taking thirty bytes at a time mm -hmm. because because it what does it make it just more human in readable? In spectrum, or? we didn't we didn't really look at this, but in spectrum, mm -hmm. there was this uh, repeated pattern. Okay. You would see the same packet of information repeated several times. What's the reason for that? Oh, uh, well, there are multiple reasons for that, most, but most likely is reliability. Mm -hmm. They're not really sure that the, the, that the receiver is going to receive any one packet, and so one super easy, cheap way to increase reliability is just to same the same, send the same thing several times and trust that the receiver will get at least one of them. So you just start screaming. Yeah. Open sesame. It's open sesame. It's <laughs> open sesame. Yes. yes. <laughs> right. Okay. Cool. Exactly. Uh, it, just like uh, when you uh, hold down the button on a on a garage door opener, mm -hmm. right? It generates a code and then it starts transmitting that same code over and over and over and over and over until you release the button. Right, and they also know that you know the angry user given just a one button device is right. just going to keep <laughs> jamming the buttons. So at least, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. So what I do here is I is I pretty much set things the way that I. Uh, that I did before, but notably I set this packet length. Mm -hmm. And so what happens is, uh, whereas up here I was getting like one long transmission kind of arbitrarily carved up into three big chunks, I'm, uh, now I'm carving it up into smaller chunks mm. that Notice that some of them are aligned with each other very precisely. Yes. You see these last five? Yeah, it's like a. They all look identical. What, what might that be? That probably means that I'm actually aligned to the beginning of the packet properly. Nice. And then with these other ones, I wasn't quite aligned to the beginning of the packet oh. properly. And so they're all kind of offset in some way. Because it's just in the time domain matters like when you're actually listening. Is that, a, is that something in the yardstick? So this is the reason why it's not always aligned correctly is because we're not using preamble detection, mm -hmm. which would normally help the clock recovery in the modem get synchronized correctly, and because our sync word is not oh we really, disabled that it's, well we are using a sync word okay uh, but but we're using a very non-distinct. Sync word. We're using a sync word oh, that's, I see that's what you're a saying. pattern, the, the of, pattern bits of bits that happens zeros. in many different places, right? Normal. Ah, so this is the one where you just guessed some binary, saying like, "Well, when you see binary, yeah, go." Kind of. So like, nor normally in a more sophisticated, not much more sophisticated, but a little bit more sophisticated radio mm -hmm. system, you'll see a preamble followed by a sync word, right, which is what we've been seeing. And mm -hmm. so we see the one zero one zero one zero, and we're like, "Okay, well, that's our clock. Right. We're not. We don't care about that." We care about the good stuff that comes right after. So had we had one of those, then we would have gotten in step with it. Right. The preamble helps you get in step. Mm -hmm. The sync word then identifies exactly which step is the start of the packet. Gotcha. So in this case, though, since it's sending it over and over and over, you'll eventually get it. I don't really get, care. Yeah, right? I don't care that some of these are out of sync. Yeah. I, enough of them are in sync that I could see the patterns there, and I could ignore the rest. All right. So here's what I did. I wrote this little function. Uh, that I will just import into my program here uh, called valid. Here, packet valid. Oops. And the packet valid function, all it's doing is just checking to see a few bit values. It's doing a sanity or byte values. It's doing a sanity check just to make sure that this packet is aligned the way I think it should be. Right. So we've already determined it's 30 bits. Right. But this is going Oops. to make sure that it's also... So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go into here and say 
I, I, I produce a packet from my RF receive function. I'm going to say if packet valid and hand it my packet, then I will print out that packet. Nice. So, that's all I'm doing is, is having a little sanity check. Mm -hmm. Now I go back to RFCAT and I'm just going to re import that. Oops. Oh, since it's live. Sweet. Look at that. Guess what I forgot to do? Um, a close sure, parenthesis. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, you know, of course. <laughs> why, why would you close that? There we go. Yeah, OK. Nice. So now if I run the same command or the same function and I type a code and hit the lock or unlock, look at those. Oh, nice. Now let me try it again. A different code. I'll hit a lock. Look at that. Check that out. We're totally seeing. Each time I hit, so I've hit the I've hit the lock or unlock button three times, and you can see three different patterns of uh, codes that were transmitted. So we see that these different sequences of bits are being transmitted. And if you do something like uh, like this, let me take this four nine two blah 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 this section in the middle here, and if I were to do uh, that's this is hexadecimal encoded, right. right? If I wanted to look at the actual Let's just turn that symbols into that were being transmitted, I could turn that into binary, I, like like so, and I can see oh it was one zero zero, one zero zero. See this is a short 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 yep. short 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 long 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 short long, right. I can I can huh. read it right there, but these aren't the actual bits that were transmitted. These are the symbols that were transmitted. And we don't know what symbol is what. Right. So what do you do? You might, you might call it a chip that was Do you have to transmit uh, four digits? I have to. Uh, yeah, could the, you the hit instruction one manual of this thing tells you you have to go four to eight digits. OK, so and you then can send the lock or one, 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 send that, two, two, yeah. two, two, send that, and then start to create your own little Rosetta Stone of what those should be? Yes, but uh, to get started, what I'd like to do is to take every group of three bits and turn it into a, a, a every group of three symbols or ah. little units of time and turn it into one bit. Right? Oh. I only have two different patterns. Right, because this is right. so because it's pulse width modulated. So pulse width modulated. So I have to do three the, bits is going to be one bit, and then yep. from there we'll actually get our bytes. Exactly. Nice. Okay. So, so I have another that. little function that I'm that I prepared. Uh, I'm going to bring this in, and what is it called? Decode. No. Oh. That would be bad to write that file. <laughs> yes. Uh, I have this PWM decode function. OK, now this is a little bit complicated, probably because I like wrote it in my hotel room late at night. Uh, or it might have been the hotel bar. Um, and uh, but all it's doing, it's probably not the cleanest implementation here. Eh. But what it's doing is bitwise manipulation mm -hmm. to just take a group of three bits and then spit out one bit. It's either it's either going to get a it's go, either going to detect yep. that it was a long pulse or a short short pulse and then spit out either a one one or a zero. zero. And nice. the way I do that actually is just by looking at the middle of those three bits. If you think oh, about it, because it's either going to be one, one zero or, or zero. Right. Yes, <laughs> right. The first one is always <laughs> high. The last one is always <laughs> low. It's just that middle bit that changes. So all I have to do is even pick easier out than Manchester. One, <laughs> one out of every three bits, and then and then collapse those together. That's all this function is doing. Cool. So then I'm going to take. Uh, the way that uh, the way that I do this is I pull it out, um, and I'm just encoding it as hexadecimal. Uh, so I'm going to do, I'm going to now instead of printing out the uh, hex that I had before, mm -hmm. now I'm going to actually decode that hex into uh, into this uh, decoded hex version and print right into the print symbols that. it's expecting. Right, right. So I'm t I'm turning symbols into bits. Got that's, it. That's the plan. So uh, there's a little bit of trickiness in terms of that bitwise manipulation, and mm -hmm. a little trickiness in terms of getting aligned correctly. But but since uh, it spammed itself long enough, we've got what we think we is have a packet. Enough to, we have way yeah. more than enough information right and, now. And to it's solve interesting those that you grab the center bit because the mm -hmm. repeating pattern at the beginning and the end is probably just saying, "Hi, I'm this manufacturer, or I'm this device." Right. Kind of setting it up. It's the middle stuff that's the good stuff. Or exactly. Yeah. yeah. So uh, so now if I run this um, and run this function, oops, I have to give it my dongle. Now, 
Oh, so this is going to happen live now, so you can just type it in again. There you go. I just hit no. five 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 five, I think, or maybe I hit five 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 five. Anyway, here, let me do zero 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 zero. Okay. Uh, one two three four four zeros, lock. There we go. Uh -huh. How about eight zeros? One two three four five six seven eight, lock. Look at that. Ooh. What if I do ones? One two three four, five six seven eight. I just did eight ones. Oh, look uh, at that. <laughs> when we had zeros, we had, yeah, we we had it resulted in Fs. When we have yeah. ones, it resulted in Es, which is mm. a good indication that we're, bit f we're flipped, nice. right? Like we're so interpreting we ones as zeros, we're interpreting zeros as ones. Okay, I mean, let's at fix the end that. of the day, who cares? Right, so we go in here and we say, uh, when, we're, when we're interpreting these bits, we're just going to XOR them with one. And There's that, that, Zora that again. flips them. So let me run this again. And try again. Now I'm going to do zero, 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 zero. So lock. you get E's instead of F's. Now I do one, 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 one. Lock. Nice. Now I do one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Lock. Look at that. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we have the bit, the byte order is, or the nibble order isn't yes. quite correct, but it's easy to see now, right? If I if I do uh, like nine 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 lock, okay. So there the, so this is like the first the 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 first digit, then the second digit, then, then the, the third, then the fourth, then and the fifth, and the sixth, and the seventh. And it rolls eight. over. So and if there are unused ones, mm -hmm. it encodes those with an with just F. Fs. Yeah. So this is kind of an interesting encoding. It never huh. uses an A, a B, a C, or a D, yeah, or an yeah, E. Yeah. It only uses the so it actually <laughs> only uses the numerals in the hex. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Which is kind of weird, That's but but it okay. works. And it's and it's like a, a nibble wise function. It's Some like engineer somewhere was like, well, how am I going to transmit a bunch of digits? Right. Well, I know hex does digits. Now let me show you something. Uh, nine 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 unlock. So you see the difference between uh, nine 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 yeah, lock? Yeah, one versus two. One versus two. So so this this digit here. So basically, I've got all my bytes reversed. But okay. I'm not going to bother fixing that because it's well, obvious. But, but at it's this obvious point. that okay. So a one is unlock. A, a two, two is lock. lock. Or I can't remember. It's the other way around. I don't. But uh, uh, it lets you. It, you can very easily see that the uh, unused digit positions are mm -hmm. Fs. And then these these eight positions are where the numerals are encoded. This byte here is always a one or a two. Mm -hmm. And then this byte here at the beginning, notice how it changes every single time we have right. a what different. Do you, what do you think that might be? I think that's a checksum. I actually have my. Oh. I have the bit. Do you have another have function the bytes to do this? Completely reversed here. Uh, is that because of the, that's just because of the timing? So the checksum is actually pretty easy to figure out in this mm -hmm. case. And checksums are. Typically, fairly easy to reverse engineer. What do you Some think it them? is? Like, what would just since <laughs> you're just gotta throw something at the wall and see if it sticks? Like, what would you guess? So the first thing I would check, uh, the first thing I would try, especially in a case where it's only an eight-bit checksum. Right. Right. Sometimes you see 16 or 32-bit CRCs or something, mm -hmm. and it's a more complicated algorithm, but they're common enough that you can use brute force tools to determine what they are. We probably don't need to do that when it's only an eight-bit checksum. It's probably something simple like. Uh, like a nibble wise or a byte wise, probably byte wise is eight bits, adding up all the previous bytes. Right. Something like that. And you can kind of figure that out. Like if I make all the previous bytes, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. If I go all zero, 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 all, uh, all eight, eight zeros. And you get FE. <sighs> Look at that. What's FE plus one? I don't know. What is <laughs> FE plus one? That would be FF. FF. Ah. Okay, let's try. One, two, three, four, five, six, mm. seven, eight. Unlock. All right, so lock is a one, unlock is a two. Oh, I got like one uh, hey, kind of one. a spurious packet here that I'm going to ignore. But uh, but notice that when I had a one there, yep. I had a FE. When I had FE. a two, Notice it's that FD. those add up to FF. They do. Right? <laughs> That's interesting. If I do so like it's a very one and <laughs> four, five, six, one followed by seven right. zeros. Now things. Now I get an EE. -E, but notice that that one is in that 
is in nibble position. position. So the, if I, the first yeah, one is always can, in the far right. Anyway, yes, you we can, can spend You can the, figure this out fairly quickly. Uh, you do have to be a little careful. Sometimes, okay. sometimes if you just get a couple of test cases and you say, oh, uh, I know what the algorithm is. Make an is. assumption and then, uh, Right, yeah. and, and then it turns out that your assumption doesn't work for every case. So you have to try a bunch of different things to, to verify well, how that checksum works. This is this is probably one of the reasons why we started out with replay attacks because it's kind of <laughs> dumb, simple, and like, you don't have to understand the protocol, you just have to send the packet again. Right, which but we can do. This is nice though, because we could make the assumption that you don't know the passcode. You only have physical access to uh -huh. the key fob and not that. And so by doing exactly what you're doing now, I imagine the next step could be to try all the combinations. It could be, right. And and this is the reason that reversing the checksum is so important, is because it it shows it, it, it provides a path to other types of uh, other avenues of attack, like brute force. Mm -hmm. You can't do a brute force easily. I mean, you can do a brute force by just trying all the codes, but that takes forever. But right. if you just try, you know, That'd a be sample like of codes. dialing all the phone numbers in your area code or <laughs> exchange. Who would do that? Who would do that? They were 13. That's oh. weird. Well, <laughs> most people who did that use an automated tool to do that, a war dialer. Yes. <laughs> and <laughs> if and if we wanted to make a war dialer for this particular lock, we would want to have our automated tool be able to produce those mm -hmm. checksums properly, and. Uh, it, so now, at this point, I think we've, we've really fully reverse engineered. There's we the know protocol. Exactly. One's locked, two's unlocked. This thing, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> everything that this thing can transmit, we know how to interpret, we know how to retransmit ourselves. Sweet. So, with that, you could, I mean, since you're in the interactive Python environment here, actually, at this point, you don't even need to, to code anything. You could write a program that just spams all 10,000 possibilities. And right. then, there's a Python program that you can always use against this one particular lock and get to the liquor in your parents' house <laughs> or whatever is behind this lock. I mean, this is motivation. <laughs> As hackers, we have to have a reason to be hacking, right? You know the song. <laughs> okay, well, anyway. <laughs> Either way, no, it's still really cool. I love that as an example of, uh, of using both the SDR side of it and the modem side that is the RF cat or RF cat with the yardstick one. Right. That is fantastic. Where would you go from here? Not that we're going to, but. Well, from here, uh, you know, there are kind of two different avenues. Uh, one, one is to do stuff with the yardstick one, and some one is to use do stuff with HackRL. Both are capable of doing everything that we've done today. It's just that some are more convenient for different parts of the pro you know one or the other is more convenient for different parts of uh, of the process of reverse engineering. But if we wanted to transmit signals, if we wanted to do a replay attack, we can do it either way. We can replay the raw IQ data that mm -hmm. we restore that we stored from Osmocom FFT. We could replay that with HackRF, or we could take. We wouldn't even have to touch any Python. Right. It's super easy. We code wouldn't goes even in, code goes out. You, you can't explain it. You wouldn't even need to understand what the modulation is. Mm -hmm. But if you want to do more sophisticated things like a brute force attack, yeah. then you have to understand what the modulation is. You have to decode it. You have to reverse the CRC that we've done. And once we do that, we could actually transmit bits using the yardstick one solution. Um, but we would need a few more functions in Python if we want to take, say, like the, the sequence of of mm -hmm. interpreted data bits or right. data bytes that we have and turn that back into 1101010100 etc those symbols right. we would need to uh, you know write a couple more functions in python to do that in the other direction and then we can transmit those it's transmitting with rf cat is just as easy as receiving with rf cat and so once I'll, you've got it yeah. set up, that mm -hmm. makes yeah. so much sense. And yep. we haven't been doing that. And I, I love just seeing how, like, wow, that makes it so much easier than dealing with clock recovery. <laughs> <laughs> just putting that out there. Maybe next time we have you on. Maybe. Yes. <laughs> we can get out the or, whiteboard. <laughs> or tune into Mike's uh, just wonderful videos. I really can't speak highly enough about these because uh, I I can personally vouch as somebody who has taken Mike's class. Uh, Mike goes around teaching SDR at conferences and such. And um, the way that you describe the theory is such that like even a noob like myself could understand it and walk away like, oh, so if you want that, go and 
watch your videos. Yeah. Even Thank if you. you're just starting out with an RTL SDR. Although, you know. Although, caveat. Yeah. I still haven't gotten to clock recovery in my videos. I will. Yeah. I will. I'm like well, 10 videos in and I haven't gotten to it yet, but it's coming up fairly soon. Okay. Rad. Well, hey, thanks so much. Is there anything that we haven't touched on regarding this that we should have? Telescopic antennas. Okay. Yeah. You know, I noticed I'm gonna that throw you, you actually. I'm going to throw you for a loop. Yeah. Because. Because that's, that's what you get with the yardstick, and so you just exactly. leave it like this because it's more convenient. Or no, no, you, you put it all the way out because then you look more hacker cool, right? Right, but that you might have noticed that I set these up to be about the same length because yes. uh, generally speaking, you want a telescopic antenna to, to perform the best. You want it to be about one quarter of the wavelength. Mm -hmm. How do you know what, what, what wavelength is? Well, you divide it by C and then you're done, exactly. right? right. Yeah. So you take C, which is 300 million meters per second. Just so happens to be a constant. Yeah. And you divide that by your frequency. So 300 million meters per second mm. divided by our frequency, which is about 300 million, uh, is about one meter, right? So we're, we're <laughs> dealing with well, roughly. We're, but we're not doing, we're not doing full <laughs> wavelength, though. Exactly. We want to go to a quarter wavelength. Mm. So 300, so, so if a we have a one meter. quarter of one meter is about be this long. Yay tall. Yeah. So I just set these to be about a quarter of a meter tall. Uh, and so anytime you have a telescopic antenna, you have the power oh, to tune your antenna to whatever wavelength you want. Ah. And uh, with uh, certain antennas like this, you can maybe rotate them or turn them in different directions. Right, but the right, most important sure feature is that it can, it can change, it can change uh, length. And so you want to kind of tune it as close as, it doesn't have to be perfect, but you want it to be right. as close as you can to about a quarter wavelength. And uh, these things can be a little bit fragile. And so just a tip, like uh, connect, collapse them one segment at a time, like so. Oh, Instead okay. of going, jamming like it down I like just that. Because you will, you will bend your antenna that way, okay. right? Especially when it's all the way out. So just collapse it one at a time. Uh, and they say, I don't know if this is absolutely essential, but they say like if you want it to be uh, like at this length, you mm -hmm. do it like so. You extend it all the way mm -hmm. and then push it and collapse it into this top segment instead of just oh, instead of pulling, pulling out just it out the, like the, that. the top part. I'm not sure actually if the, the performance is any different, but the durability is different. Yes. Well, that's that's one thing. There yeah. you go. Another little RF tip. Fun facts about telescopic antennas. Mike is full of those. <laughs> oh man, uh, Mike, t like you've been just on a roll lately uh, between Hack RF and Yardstick One, and I know you've got other fun things coming. Uh, do you want to talk about either of those or let people know where they can find all of that fun stuff when it comes? Well, everything that I do is uh, usually found uh, on greatscottgadgets.com and uh, that's where my SDR video series is, of course, so anybody who's interested in going through that, it's all open content and uh, available for everyone. Um, any, any new uh, exciting things that we're working on either get posted to the blog there or mentioned on our mailing list that you can sign up for uh, at gridscottgadgets.com. All right. Hey, Mike, thank you so much. A pleasure as always. Um, and yes, really go check that out. This is, all the videos are on Archive.org. They're fantastic. Thanks for having me. Dear. Yeah, likewise. That just about wraps up this week's episode of Hack 5. But before we get going, a couple of fun announcements. Hope you guys have been enjoying, enjoying even the SDR series. Uh, Shannon, you did a little playlist about that, huh? Uh, yes, I did. <laughs> I was like, did I do that playlist? I did. It's on youtube.com slash hack5, and you can go into playlists, and you can watch like all 60 episodes that we've done about SDR. I'll be including the ones from Mike Osman as well in that lineup, too. Right. So it might be useful if you've been using our SDR ones in classrooms or et cetera, et cetera. Or you you're just really bored and you want to watch all of them. Or figure out why the speed of light matters. <laughs> Which it, it does. It turns out pretty important. Yeah, Good stuff. Important. Also very thankful for the ionosphere and the molten core. <laughs> yeah. Electromagnetism is one of my favorite things in the universe. Have I ever told you that? You know what else is one of my favorite things? When all the cool Hack 5 fans in the Barry area get to come by the Hack 5 warehouse, we have a little barbecue. Are we having another one? We are having another one December yes. 5th. This one is special because we're having a garage sale. That's right, we are. So we've been cleaning out our warehouse of all the old things that we no longer use or we uh, we've oh, we got, upgraded from. We've got robots and 3D printers we and just crazy cameras. stuff that needs to find a new home. Tons of things. Yes. So if you feel like checking out our gear, uh, I believe we're going to be donating 
part of the proceeds as well to the EFF, which yes. I've already contacted them about and asked them if we can do that. So they said yes. The I Very love excited the to people. support the EFF. Yeah. So um, yeah, come by, check out our warehouse garage sale. It'll be lots of fun, December 5th. And the times and everything will be updated on the Hack5 website. Hack5.org slash open house. Right. You have to sign up and then you get an email from us. So interrupted. What? Follow oh. us on the, tw the social networks, Twitter and everything, for updates on that as well. Twit rars. Twit rars. There we go. <laughs> um, that, that was, by the way, a great idea, having this open house. I agree. You know what else is a great idea? Getting yourself a domain name from domain.com. I know, we've told you guys before, we're huge fans of them and there's a good reason for it. It's because we love them and they love us and it's a symbiotic relationship where fast and easy and affordable web hosting and domain names and going drinking and your website's online like that, it's amazing! I've told you guys time and time again how much it's just a snap if you're looking for your .com or your hosting, but right now, right now is the most epic time! Have you heard about the sale? Hack Jumbo ends at the end of the month, so you really need to get in on this right now because it saves you 35% off new domain registrations. That's huge. So act now, November 30th uh, is when it ends, so get in on that. Go over to domain.com, use the coupon code HAKJUMBO, and you know what? Tweet some love at domain.com. Thank them for supporting Hack5 for so many years. And remember, when you think domain names, think domain.com. And with that, I believe we are out. I think Thank so. Thank you <laughs> for, uh, for watching. Thank you for commenting. And we will see you on the internet next week. Until then, I'm Darren Kitchen. That was a fly. I'm Shannon Morse. I'm going to fly drones in the warehouse at the open house. Trust your technology. Before we actually get into the setup and the demo, I do want to talk real quick about some of the differences between the Yardstick 1 and the other CC1111 dongles. So most